Ladies and gentlemen, this is the RTF Sports Network's Great Debate. I am your host for the evening, Brandon Combs, and with me today is a star-studded group from some of the network's best shows. They need no introduction, but we will give them one anyways. First, from the Infinity Sports Podcast, we have Wayne G. What's going on, guys? I'm guessing you just watched us. It was a great lead into this show. I am Wayne G. I'm one of the three hosts for the Infinity Sports Podcast podcast you can listen to us tuesdays and thursdays on the rtf sports network at 1 p.m or download on itunes spotify and stitcher we also go live on facebook every monday and wednesday at 7 p.m next we have from the mike and mike man hour mike leblanc What's up, guys? I'm Mike from the Mike and Mike Man Hour. You can catch us on RTF Sports Network Monday through Friday, noon Eastern time. Or you can go ahead and go like the Mike and Mike Man Hour Facebook post and get that notification when we go live. iTunes right. and Spotify. And next we have from the Triple Shot Sports Podcast, he is the Soup Boss, Chad Lounder. Hey, guys. Soup Boss here, obviously. Getting to sit across from my co-host, which means I have zero chance of winning this thing. But that's okay. We're here. We're pumped. We're going to be on every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday night, Central Time, from 7 to 9. And then you can catch us on the ride home. If you missed that live recording, catch us on the very next day, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And we'd love to be able to have you be a part of this team. And you can listen to me uh, give Mr. Combs some more shit and tell him that the, the Cardinals are amazing. And last but certainly not least, from the Twist Podcast, we have Mike Reeves. What up, Mike Reeves? Twist Sports Talk. You can catch us on RTF Mondays and Thursdays at 1 p.m. Central Time. And my show, Mike on the Mic, Tuesdays at 1 p.m. All right, guys. So for those of you who have not joined us before, this is how it's going to work. Each one of the guys are going to partake in debating topics. I will award a point for a good point of view, and at the end of the first two topics, we will say goodbye to the two with the lowest total of points. Probably Chad Lounder, because he keeps saying go Cardinals on our show, so he's starting out with negative 50. That's <laughs> how I live right. my life, baby. <laughs> All right, guys. So the first topic we have here is going to be a basketball topic. Uh, is LeBron James is the best player in the last 20 years. Questionable, but we're going to go with it. Who's going to be the best player in the NBA for the next 15 or 20 years? We'll start off uh, with uh, Wayne G. Oh, I just got, I didn't know you were going to put me up. Oh, there we go. <laughs> All right. So I was going to say that to me, it's going to be Trey Young. And the reason for that is because the great player of the generation is never an evolution of the previous great player. The late 70s had Bill Walton and Kareem Abdul Jabbar that turned into Magic Johnson and Larry Bird, guys who were more like Pete Maravich. Then it turned into Jordan, guy who was more like Dr. J. It turned into Shaq, who was more like Ewing. And then it turned into LeBron, who was more like Pippen or Grant Hill. Trey Young is an evolution of Steph Curry, a former unanimous MVP, except for the fact that he's a better passer. He's just as athletic. He handles the ball as much. He's got the same kind of range, but he averages nine assists a game. Now, this is a guy who led the nation in scoring and assists in the same season in his uh, last year of college, his one year of college. He's going to do the same thing for seven or eight years in the NBA. So this is a guy who I think once you know, all is said and done, LeBron's out of the game, Trey Young is going to be the star, as much as I love Luka Doncic, as much as Giannis is the best player maybe right now, he's kind of that evolution of LeBron, a big, defensive, all-around kind of player. So I think that that's why he's not going to be the best, because like I said, the best player of a generation is never an evolution of the previous best player. So well under my two minutes here, I'm going to say again, Trey Young is the next great player in the NBA. All right, Mike Greaves, what do you have to say? Well, it's not really about a transition from one to the other. The NBA is all about marketing, and it's from a marketability standpoint. So the easy answer is Zion Williamson. The trouble is he can't even play past five minutes a stint. Uh, there's never been a player from a different country that's been the face of the NBA. Giannis is going to be 30 by the time LeBron is off the court. Luka, to me, is the clear-cut answer. You know, he's 21 years old. Um, he comes in and pretty much is a triple-double machine. Um, for global domination, which is what the NBA wants, and a marketability standpoint, Luka Doncic is going to be that guy. 
All right, Mike Reed, or I'm sorry, uh, Mike LeBlanc. All right, man. I'm I'm I might butcher this guy's name. Giannis, his last name starts with an A. This guy Antetokounmpo. Yeah, this guy. That's fifty you, negative points right there. God yeah. damn it. <laughs> <laughs> this guy is he's the reigning MVP by far. And by far, he's the best player. And he's on pace to post one of the biggest re- records in league history, right? This guy can take it from floor to floor. Um, he's not unlike LeBron or Shaquille O'Neal. And guarding him is like, is almost a physic, like, it's just impossible to guard this guy. So at the end of the day, for the next 20 or next 5, 10, 15 years, this is the guy that I think we're going to start to see transcend like Kobe Bryant. We're going to start to see him transcend like LeBron James and maybe even like Michael Jordan. So I know I'm well with under my 20 minute or my, my, my <laughs> two minutes, but uh, Giannis is, is, is going to be that guy. All right. Sue boss. Yeah, this is fantastic. So everyone went well under their two minutes. That gives me like what six minutes to be able to come up with this. I love it. Okay, yeah, listen. Time you usually get. Yeah, I know exactly. So listen, I knew I wanted to be able to come straight out and say Jason Tatum because I'm a big Celtics fan. But I'm going to try to do the opposite of Mr. Combs here, not just automatically go with the homer pick. Zion, you've got the issues with injury. That's going to be a big thing. Trey Young is from OU. I'm a Longhorns fan. I can't say Trey Young. I respect the pick. He's got better range than Curry, but I can't do it. Giannis is. It, not Giannis, Giannis right now is the leader. He's the reigning MVP. And you, it also says 15 to 20 years. And though he's still young, 25, 26 years old, yeah, that's a different type of, you know, he's going to get older pretty quick. Luca is the, is the trendy pick. So what I wanted to do is look at what makes a great player, what makes a leader really stand out. And usually it's someone that went lower in a draft put a chip on their shoulder, a la Tom Brady, a la Michael Jordan. Even though Jordan was third, he still expected himself to be first. And they get better every year. They get they make the team around them better every year. They make the people that play them say, you know what, I can't stand dealing with them, but that's a damn good player. And I went through all of the players, 25 and under, to see who has all of those things. And I came up with one player. Now, the market he's in is really hard, so it's going to depend on what he can either do to succeed there or go to another market and really show his worth. But by and far, Donovan Mitchell out of Salt Lake City, who was expected to be in the top 10, was drafted well out of the top 10, was really upset about that. He put that chip on his shoulder. He put the respect mentality of, I'm going to work my ass off and be able to get to the top. Every single year, his stats have continued to increase. He was ranked fourth in the NBA just two years ago. He continues to get better. His teammates around him get better. And all of his opponents continue to say what an amazing guy he is. It's a pain to play against him. He's made the Utah Jazz, for crying out loud, actually be successful in the Western Conference. And if you didn't have LeBron and AD going out there in L.A., who knows the chance of what he might have been able to do. I'm not going to lie. I don't even know who Donovan Mitchell is. I know. know I knew it. it. This is the problem that you be the judge. Utah Jazz. I should have just said Larry Bird. You would have been like, I know that name. That sounds great. I think that, yeah. Oh my God! Son of a All right, bitch. do we get to rebuttal so, off these other answers or what? Yeah, absolutely. Away. Absolutely. Here's here's the right. thing. Here's the thing with the face of the NBA. Giannis can't even speak English. Have you heard him on a mic? The NBA wants so badly for for Zion Williamson to be the face. He's the first person since LeBron James that the nation has seen since he's been in high school. You know, LeBron was the first overall. He's America's sweetheart, and he's lived up to the hype. That's you one know. of the things I've said on my show before is that uh, I think the NBA created this whole playoff system the way that they structured it just to get Zion into it. They 100% did. They want him to be the face. It's all marketability with the NBA. The NFL is a whole different ball game. The MLB will get into that in the next one. But it's it's the face of the NBA. And if you can't hop on a mic and do an interview, you can't be the face. Wayne? See, I was looking at does, as, but does you, being you, the you face might... help you though? Did being the face help you though if you can't play? And I and I bring up this example for all of us old enough to remember. Grant Hill was going to be the face of the NBA. Everyone loved him. He was America's sweetheart. Everyone, whether you hated him 
or you respected him or you loved him, no matter what, it was a Derek Jeter type of thing. Like that's what we were looking at with Grant Hill and he couldn't stay healthy. And he ended up being that Cinderella story down at the end where he kind of did something better, kind of what we're seeing with D Rose, but it still wasn't the leader of the league. And Zion, I love the kid. He can't stay healthy. He's got to stop trying to do master dunks just because a bunch of Froofy high school girls three years ago, you know, thought it was an amazing thing and they wanted to get into his pants. All right, Wayne G, what do you say? Well, I think that it, obviously Giannis was the easy pick, and that's why I think if you ever watch an episode of Scooby Doo and you think it's going to be the uh, the operator of the roller coaster, but it's actually the person selling popcorn is the person with the mask on. <laughs> Trey Young is the one selling popcorn because everyone's looking at Giannis. He's just not going to be that guy. He's got a great game. He's getting better every year. Zion, I understand the talk of Zion being the face of the NBA because he does have that electricity around him. He does have that appeal, that lure that he had before he even played a game, but I just don't think he's going to play enough games, like Chad said, that he's going to be able to make that last. Now, the thing about Trey Young is he doesn't play in a small market like Donovan Mitchell, who is a fantastic player, by the way, but like you said, in Utah, never going to, nobody's ever going to hear from him. So Trey Young is in Atlanta. It's a semi-big market. He's got all the skill set. He's going to do for Atlanta, what Steph created for Golden State, which is bring them to the top with that roster. Michael Bont? Yeah, Zion Williams. I, I I agree with you, Mike Williams. They or Mike Reeves, they want him to be the face of the NBA, just like they did with Kobe, just like they did with LeBron, just like they did with Jordan. But it go, he can't stay healthy. He can't stay on the court long enough. Now, Giannis, on the other hand, I get why you say, oh, because he can't get on the mic. He can't he can't do an interview. You have to understand that we're living in a totally different time period now. We're not living in the all-American. We're, hey, we're, we want to be culturally biased. We want to be culturally sound. So, yes, I think Giannis will be the face of the NBA, and it will be for a while. I mean, this kid is amazing, like – He's making the Milwaukee Bucks relevant. Do you understand how hard that is to do? Milwaukee <laughs> hasn't been relevant, and don't worry, I'll wait. Can anybody here tell me last time the Bucks were actually relevant? Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Okay, thank you. So way back before any of us, we were all kids, are swimming in our dad's sack when Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was playing. <laughs> He's making the Bucks relevant again. So yes, he is Giannis is going to be the face of that or face of the franchise for the Bucks for a while, and he's going to be the face of the NBA for a while. Real quick right. on the Zion Williamson thing. The NBA is is sugar coat. He's not injury prone. He played, he got hurt in the ACC tournament right before it, and he was cleared by the Duke doctors. He played three games of over 30 minutes a game. The Pelicans are just they got their kid gloves on with them. He's the first overall pick, and they just don't want to risk it. So he's not hes not necessarily injury prone. He didn't tear an ACL. He had a meniscus tear, and they, they eased with caution with them. So, yeah, so don't, it, let the, it, don't let the media spin it out right. of, like he's some injury prone. All right, guys, we're going we're gonna to move on here, and uh, we're going to get into some, some talk that I can actually understand. Uh, we're going to get into some baseball talk here. Uh, There's been a lot of talk about baseball, maybe not even finishing a 60-game season. They have a whole lot of trouble drawing viewers. Um, I'm not one of them. I love the game. I'll I'll watch every game every day. Um, But they're having a hard time bringing in, especially younger fans. So that's what round two is, is going to be why is baseball having such a hard time attracting younger viewers? And uh, Soup Boss, we'll go ahead and we'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, we just talked about this uh, just last night uh, on our on our video cast, but I'll jump into it again. It's the attention span, and listen, it it comes down to two things: the attention span of the current generation, which is I just had sat here and had a whole conversation with my kids in the car yesterday about Quibi. Quibi is a streaming service in which everything is ten minutes. YouTube they want you going to ten minutes for ads because. That's about where they know that they'll get the mass amount of watching and be able to make it so it's worth the the, the advertiser's money. It's a, The attention span is one thing. The other aspect of it is that we are so gripped as baseball fans for some reason to hold on to the history of this game. Listen, there's a reason the NBA leapfrogged the MLB from three to two because they realized, listen, we could still honor the past. Guys like Bill Russell, Will Chamberlain, MJ, we can honor that through – 
trophies, through awards, through bringing them into all-star games, all those things. But we got to change the game to be played to cater to our fans. They made it into an individual league. And even though we have conversations on our show about the issues with the ego and how it starts grooming today from middle school up, that's what the, the whole focus of sports is about now. And baseball is still team driven. Fans still, older fans still grasp to the historical aspect when you need to go quicker, you need to go faster, and you need to start. Mike Trout, if, if he was Mike Trout in any of the, the other two leagues, NFL or NBA, he would be plastered everywhere, everywhere by MLB because it's not seen and done in the same way, and it's a shame. Mike LeBlanc? Yeah, I mean, let's be honest. Baseball is what? Man, what do they play? Like a million games in one season? 162, sir. 162 games, right? Who really can sit there as a fan and pay attention to every single game throughout the season? And let's be honest, baseball's boring to watch. It's not super exciting until you start to get into the hunt for the red October. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm a huge Yankees fan. I love watching my Yankees play. But, like, I will still – like, NBA, I will still watch other teams play – Oh, I get points taken away. Okay. <laughs> the NFL. Like, you watch baseball like, is boring. I'll wa- it is. Ba- baseball gets boring to watch. You, I mean, it's the same thing over and over and over every single day, right? That's why, and just like Superball said, this younger generation, you don't have their attention span. That's why, we ha- that's why TikTok is so famous because it's 60 seconds, and then, boom, they can scroll to the next one. It's the same thing with baseball. There's too many games, shorten the season, and then it'll give it a little bit more meaning because 162 games, if you go on a a 10, 12 losing spree, oh, big deal. You can make that up. It's not a big deal. Like with football, basketball, you go on, on that long of a losing streak, your season's in jeopardy at that point. With baseball, it's just not. Wayne G. Yeah, so kind of combining the two ideas, I have the similar kind of ideas as those guys, which, one, the biggest problem with why they can't attract younger viewers is baseball traditionalists. See, old, bald, 90-year-old men hate change. And so you can't attract a 12- to 19-year-old fan base by advertising Geritone on the players' jerseys. You need to tweak the rules a little bit, make the games a little bit faster. Because back in the day, you had one pitcher pitch all nine innings unless he got hurt, unless he's getting shelled to bring in a reliever. Now they bring in a lefty to face a lefty because he throws a slider, and they'll bring in a different lefty to face the next lefty because he throws a splitter. And all the nuance adds to the time of the game. That's why we have three-and-a-half-hour games. Nobody wants to sit there and watch that, especially like Mike said, when – You've got 162 of them. Do I really want to watch three hours of a meaningless game? Because guess what? Every single game is meaningless unless you shorten the season. So that's where traditionalists hate it. We're not shortening the season. You need to have a 100-game season max. You need to have a pitch clock. You need to not let players leave the box. You need to limit the mound visits. And I have no problem with them making a relief pitcher pitch a goddamn inning. Because you know what? That's your job, not to come in and face a guy and throw two pitches. And then you do need to market the players. Like Chad said, you need to market the players as more important than any team in the league. Little leaguers don't get their favorite team's number on the back of their Jersey. They get their favorite players number and major league baseball has done the worst job of any of the major sports in marketing their players. They had a chance to put Yasiel Puig in the home run derby a few years ago when he was a rookie and they didn't because traditionalists didn't think he played enough games to get in there, but fans wanted to see him appease the fans. Yes. You'll turn into the NBA. Yes. You'll have, have bigger babies out in the field, but you know what else you're going to have? You're going to have a fan base that isn't going to die in a year and a half. <laughs> All right, Mike Reeves. Yeah, you know why the average uh, age of viewership of the NBA is 37 compared to baseball's 53. It's all because the NBA is best at marketing their players. I loved Wayne's um, comment about speeding up the game. There was a guy back in the day who took a stopwatch from the the time the ball left the pitcher's hand. To the mitt. So actual gameplay in a baseball game is nine minutes. You talk about these kids not being able to to keep up with it. There's nine minutes of actual gameplay in over a three hour game. It's slow, it's boring, and it can't keep up. You know, the trouble is players just aren't playing the sport as much either. You have these three sport athletes, you know, basketball, football, baseball. When, when it comes down to choose what they're going to actually do, baseball loses. You look at a player like Kyler Murray, who was just taken, you know, first overall last year. 
he was already drafted by the Oakland Athletics. He's he looks at it and says, "Look, I can be the face of a franchise in the NFL, be the number one overall pick, and make more money right away." You know, you get these players that get drafted, um, and you don't see them for four or five years, just like in hockey. So the draft really means nothing. Nobody pays attention to it. You know, it comes down to a marketability standpoint again. You know, baseball. I like has- what Mike said there, though, about, about how you're talking about Kyler Murray and making more money in the NFL. I think overall, I think if he went to baseball, you the contracts in baseball, you're going to make way more money than you are in the NFL. So I'm not sure if that really played into it. But I think when it comes to younger viewers, I, I, I think you guys are kind of right. As as much as I hate to admit it, it it's the the length of the games is absolutely insane um and and it's hard to keep keep attention i do like some of the things that they're implementing some of the things i don't like i don't like how you you force a reliever to face three batters because i do like the idea of a specialist but at at the same time i you know I'm, i'm okay with some of the things but what are you guys thinking about you know as far as you know some ways to go ahead and improve it to attract younger fans I'll give you my very first re- way that you're going to be able to do this. And I'm blown away because I let it slip and I didn't mention it. And these other three didn't say it. His name is Robert D. Manfred Jr. Get this Yahoo out of that position as commissioner. Gotta he has go. zero focus of understanding what the team, I mean, what the league needs. So we looked at Selig during that, that all-star game in which he was like in the 10th inning, like, oh, I don't know what to do. We were like, what a debacle. Right now, Manfred can't even wipe his own ass with MLB apparel uh, toilet paper and not get it wrong. Like, he is literally killing this league. I give him kudos for the fact that he said, hey, listen, when the Marlins stuff happened, I admitted it. I was waiting for him to be like, oh, there's my reason to fold it up. I'm going to fold the pressure. It's going to still, though, happen, though. He's a terrible commissioner. He was supposed to take over for Selig and bring it above to where it was, and he's done the opposite. You look at Adam Silver, the guy came in and goes, listen, we're going to kick this shit up a notch. We're going to completely make this about the fans. We're going to get them jerseys where they can make Dwayne Wade's jersey be today or the classic one. They can change it on their cell phone because why everyone has one of these. He's, Manfred still thinks that you go to a game with, with an old newspaper and you take the pitch counts. That's the problem. Manfred what about is the you, problem. Bonk? How do we go ahead and get more viewers of, of the younger age? Yeah, I mean, it's exactly what Suitball said. You, you've got to make the game more exciting. Start marketing the players. Look, I like the Yankees. I've always been a big Yankees fan, but I love the Yankees now even more because of Aaron Judge. Like Aaron Judge is my guy. I love watching this guy play. Right, so shorten taking take the games from 162. Wayne, I say take it even further down. I, I say take it to 80 to 90 games. That way, games start meaning something, and then I think that's how you'll start getting. And and then let's get the game on the road. Let's not wait three hours, three and a half hours for a long game. Nobody likes watching that. You're killing me with less baseball talk, man. You're killing me, Wayne. <laughs> Well, again, I think it's going to be two things that baseball purists hate, and that's innovation. The first of those things is going to be gimmicky-type rules. People love that stuff. They'll tune in for that stuff. Have it so that from the eighth inning on, one guy gets to use an aluminum bat, and you don't know who it's going to be. When you tell me your buddy messages you and texts you and says, hey, Trout's got an aluminum bat. You're not tuning in? Like, you want to see that. It's a gimmicky rule, but it gets people to watch. I like the idea of a rule where you could uh, you know, pinch hit somebody at any point in the game, even if they've already been pinch hit before. That's kind of an interesting idea. But the craziest idea – How about a salary cap? Baseball is the only sport Mm. of the four that doesn't have a salary cap, doesn't have parity. So why not have a salary cap? You know what? The players would actually love it because it'd make more money. Right now, the players make 30% of league revenue. If they had a salary cap with a league floor and a league ceiling, they would actually make 50% of league revenue and everybody would get paid more. I'm going to tell you right now, if you give these guys an aluminum bat, I'm just tuning in to see which pitcher dies that day. (laughs) That's, That's what I'm tuning in to see. What do you say, Reeves? Yeah, aluminum bat is not happening. I do like the way, you know, of changing stuff up. The trouble with it, the baseball purists aren't going to be around when baseball's dead. You know, you have to change things now. And I love Supas, you know, how we talked about Adam Silver. Adam Silver took an NBA and put it on steroids. And that's while they're catapulting ahead of every other sport just behind the NFL. Um, really, other players, like I kind of commented on before, they're not going to pick baseball unless things change. So we're not going to say see a change in baseball probably for at least the next 15 to 20 years until the youth 
actually decides to make that move and want to be a part of the baseball culture. You know, again, marketability, marketability, marketability. That starts at the top with Manfred down to ownership. And then, you know, each city, you got to market your players, your fans. That's what's selling the jerseys, the stadium tickets, all that kind of stuff. And that that comes down to marketability. Yeah, absolutely. I I mean, you guys have a lot of great points. Uh, There's lots of things that they can do for the game. I, I, you know, some of it I like. I, I kind of consider myself a purist, but at the same time, I'm okay with some of the smaller changes, uh, some of the things that they're doing to, to bring in younger viewers. All right, so moving on to round three. Uh, you know, we already talked about a little bit of basketball, uh, but we're going to talk some more. But before we do that, we do have to say goodbye to our two with the fewest amount of points, and that would be Mike LeBlanc and the Soup Boss. Uh, I would just like to make guys. sure everyone knows that all three of these individuals quoted the suit boss as having. <laughs> I got robbed. He took he took points away because I wanted this. <laughs> you did. <laughs> all right, guys. So we're just down to the two of you. Uh, what we're going to do now, we're going to get down to these final two topics. And the one with the most points at the end of it will get a uh, two minutes to talk about and promote the show. All right, so here we go. So we're going into, is this the greatest era of NBA basketball that we've ever seen? And we'll start with uh, Wayne G. Yeah, I'm actually going to take an unpopular stance and say, yes, it is. And I understand that the players today are prima donnas. They flop at every single foul call. They complain. They pose after every single layup that they get. And they're just, just insufferable to watch. And I understand that 100%. But if you can look past that and take your personal opinion away from it, these are the most athletic players that we've ever seen in any generation. These are the most skilled players in terms of ball handling, shooting, just passing. LeBron James might be the greatest passer we've ever seen. It is the best era of basketball, even though there may not be a whole lot of defense. You can't really defense uh, defend good ball movement. And that's the problem. They move the ball so well. They pass so well. They score so well. They shoot so well. This is the best era. I understand it's not popular because everyone thinks Jordan's era was the best because they were tough and they would close line each other and it wouldn't get called. But the reality is that Jordan's era would get smoked by this era in terms of overall skill. The Golden State Warriors would beat that Bulls team, that 72 and 10 Bulls team, four games to one. Oh, no. it's, it's not even close. Oh, Mike Reeves, what do you say to that? I like a lot of what Wayne said. The trouble is, you know, this era is just starting. We're in 2020. You know, 1980s for me was probably the best generation of basketball that we've we've seen. Undoubtedly, basketball became prominent in the 80s. Without the 80s, the NBA might not have gotten the chance to talk so much and highly about, you know, the next few generations. You had the Magic and Bird rivalry that originated, you know, in college. You don't get to see a lot of those college rivalries like we did with Bird and magic. You know, they had 20 all-star appearances together, eight NBA championships, six MVP awards, eight NBA championships between those two in 10 years. I mean, that's remarkable. You know, LeBron is about all you get right now of eight in a row and, you know, Golden State, but they're building super teams. Not that the, the Celtics didn't have a super team, but built it on their own. They weren't the only two yet. Isaiah Thomas, Moses Malone, Dominique Wilkins, um, you know, they had a lot of guys. So I, I really like the 80s, not only for, you know, the catapulting of, of what it allowed. Um, you know, this decade's probably not even next for me. It'd be the early 2000s. You look at that 2003 draft, um, then the 90s and and now probably a little bit more. But yeah, I I mean, I yeah, I I, I can't say that this era is the best. But um, Wayne, what do you guys say to what Mike said? Yeah, no, the 80s was a great era, but I think that you have to remember that the early 80s, NBA was in trouble. And Magic and Larry Bird put a Band-Aid on the league to save it, to keep it from bleeding out. But when Michael Jordan got drafted in 84, came in in 85, he actually healed the league with a Magic wand that made it stronger than ever. And why was that? Because he was dunking on people from the foul line, because he would had that crazy hang time, because nobody had seen anything like that before. We see it. There's eight guys on every NBA team right now that are as athletic as Michael Jordan. They can all dunk from the foul line. They can all dunk between their legs. They can all shoot from 40 feet deep. Like I said, it's just the most skilled and most athletic era we've ever seen. The problem is if they weren't all such babies, if we didn't have LeBron James flopping when somebody got within a foot of him, 
there would be no argument. Everyone would agree this is the greatest era of all time. But they're babies, so we can't take that personal feeling of hating them out of the fact that their skill and their athleticism is more than we've ever seen before. You, know, you also look at that, though, and if, if you watched uh, The Last Dance with Michael Jordan and, and he talks about Magic Johnson and actually having to beat the Lakers – you know, to kind of elevate himself. So from one of the best players who's ever played the game, he looked at that generation as something that he had to beat up before he could elevate his name and his game to that next level. It, isn't the problem more, you know, just than the flopping, it is the desire to actually go out and, and win championships. I think that a lot of the players nowadays are more concerned with making money and building their brand than they are with winning champ. You, Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant. I mean, those guys were they. They would kill somebody to win a title, and now you just got these guys who all they want to do is build their brand. Isn't that more of a problem with today's era than it was with you know, back then? Michael Jordan's worth one point five billion dollars because he built his brand. I mean, he used the NBA to build his brand. It's not like he didn't do it. They all, they've all been doing it since the beginning of time, is trying to make as much money as possible. I think the guys care about winning now. And like Mike said, you know, they build these super teams or they get together to build super teams because they want to win, and they don't care about their legacies. A lot of them, like Kevin Durant, kind of does. He's a little bit of a baby about it. But you think LeBron gives a crap if people crap on him about his legacy because he created a super team? He doesn't care. All he cares at the end of the day is about winning championships. These guys do want to win. It's just you know, I think they get a bad rap for trying to win however they can yeah lebron james can't make a shoe to save his life his brand and his <laughs> his clothing line ain't getting it done like lebron or like michael jordan you know but he's he's the rare form him and kobe um kind of had that next that next level of, of really wanting to win and get it done where some of the other players you're you're absolutely right it is about branding and and trying to elevate themselves because they don't have it to be able to win the championships and elevate a team. You look at LeBron James, I believe, two years after he he got drafted in 05, I, I think it was, against the Spurs. If you ever look at that lineup and who was on that team, you don't recognize any of the players because they were horrible. And he, he got swept in the finals, but he single-handedly brought that team to the finals. I mean, he's just – he's on another level. Yeah, absolutely. I, I just think with – Back then, I think that you had everybody, even the guys who were on the bench, were willing to go out there and 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 bleed and and go at and and take your throat out to try to win. And nowadays, I just I don't think you got your stars, but once you get past your stars, you don't know anybody's name. And, and you did back then; you knew who was on the bench back then. You don't anymore. So, all right. So we're gonna get to. Round four, and round four is actually a good one. Soup Boss probably wishes he was still here, but, you know, he talks about the Cardinals, so he's gone. Uh, so we're going to get to, is Bill Belichick the greatest coach in the history of pro sports? And we'll start with you, Mike Reeves. Uh, easy answer, no. He's a cheater, he's a fraud, and I hate him. <laughs> Nine Super Bowl appearances, 17 division titles. Yeah, he's he's the GOAT in the NFL. Um, but as far as in sports history, I got to give it up to my man, John Wooden. Uh, it's all about championships. Um, he, uh, 12-year period, won seven in a row. Uh, and that's in college. I mean, to me, college coaches, you look at Coach K um, with Duke, Calipari with Kentucky, who's not even on Coach K's level. But college athletes is, you know, the hardest one to win championships with. So John Wooden, to me, takes that top spot. Phil Jackson is another Zen master um, himself. And you look at the talent he had around him, but at the same time, it, it does take the coach. So Bill Belichick, he's cheating again this year. I think half their roster has already opted out. Uh, they're going after Trevor Lawrence, um, and, and he's got to cheat to win. But, you know, if you're not Ooh, cheating, you're not winning, point. I guess. That's a good point. All right, go ahead, Wayne. Yeah, so I think that Bill Belichick is the greatest coach in sports history. I have John Wooden listed here. He is an amazing coach, but I agree with you that college basketball is harder. Or college sports is harder now with the one-and-done rule, particularly in basketball. Back in Wooden coach, it wasn't one-and-done. You played all four years. So basically, John Wooden had Kareem Abdul-Jabbar as a freshman, a sophomore, a junior, and a senior. Then Bill Walton as a freshman, a sophomore, a junior, and a senior. So every year, he got four years out of a team. So that's why he had an eight, ten-year dynasty, because he basically only fielded two or three teams his entire career. Whereas 
Bill Belichick coaches in a league where you win the Super Bowl, go five and 11 the very next year. The player turnover is so frequent. And I don't even want to mention him as a general manager and how he kind of fills those holes. I mean, Tom Brady is the GOAT and he's called a system quarterback. Whose system is he playing in? Bill Belichick's system. I mean, Bill Belichick is a genius. He comes up with creative ways to do things every year. And I know people talk about the whole cheating because he decided to videotape three feet left from where you're allowed to videotape from. But the reality is he hasn't really broken rules like the 49ers who manipulated the salary cap or something like that with Bill Walsh. And just of all the sports, this is the hardest sport to dominate in for a long period of time. And he's done it. He's done the impossible. No other coach will ever come along and dominate this particular league the way that he has. Yeah, I mean, look, I Bill Belichick has won so much with with so far less around him. I know, I know, you brought up Wooden Reeves, but you got so much less that that Bill Belichick has won with, and year after year. I mean, granted, he's had Tom Brady. I, I joke all the time, and I hate the Patriots, but I joke all the time that he had God on the sidelines and Jesus Christ at quarterback. It, it was just one of those combinations that was just amazing. But they had nothing. I mean, the one year that they actually had a Hall of Fame wide receiver, they went undefeated. They lost Super Bowl, but they they were undefeated headed into the Super Bowl. And, and I don't, I mean, I, he's just done a lot with, with a lot less. See, I got to stick, I'm going to take what Wayne said and even flip it even more. If you take Wooden out and you put Coach K up, college basketball from a recruiting standpoint and what they're doing there, if Coach K didn't have one and dones, he'd easily be the number one. Um, he, he went and got gold with Team USA. You know, in the NFL, they have offense, they have defensive coordinators, they have a GM, they have an owner that says all these things. It's You can call Bill Belichick a GM. Um, for the NFL, hands down, 100% best coach in the NFL history. But as far as sports history, again, I'm, I'm drawing my feet in the sand, and I'm saying college sports is the toughest. So, yeah, Wooden, when he's got that, that much of a run with those kind of players, but Coach K constantly has people shuffling in and out in the recruitment standpoint. He's traveling, going across the country, doing all these different aspects. He's running the whole team to his game plan. You know, they have assistant coaches, but not like in the NFL. So to me, once again, I don't think the NFL as a whole could be a, a best coach. Wayne. See, I think college sports in general, a lot of kids will go there regardless of who the coach is. I mean, there's a reason that UCLA head coach right now is that one of the highest paid, one of the top 10 highest paid coaches in all of college basketball. It's because UCLA is the name of the team that he coaches. I mean, kids are going to go there for the school. They don't really care about the coach. I mean, some of them do, but that guy's going to leave. They're going to bring in somebody else and kids are still going to go there. I mean, the NFL is the hardest place to win championships and to win championships over and over and over again. We talk about Bill Belichick's genius. He should have two more championships for credit for Parcells because those two giant Super Bowls were credit to Bill Belichick. I mean, the guy, when they played against the Buffalo Bills, which was a speed run and gun team, he said, hey, why don't we put a couple of our wide receivers on defense so that they can keep up with the other team's wide receivers? Like, who does that? Like, nobody's that creative. It's just a a genius mindset. He was a special teams coach, and he drafted a a kicker this year, and everyone made fun of him. They said, well, why'd you take this kicker? He said, because I watch how the ball spins off of his foot in cold weather. I mean, the guy pays attention to detail like nobody else in any other sport, no matter how much new nuances in all the sports i think just football is the hardest he's the best in the hardest sport that makes him the best of all sports they also pick a college coach and coach k to make him you know coach nba players and win gold and the respect that he has from professional athletes is just on another level so yeah and Wayne, when you say that, uh, that kids are going to go to school because of the of the college i, th- I think when it comes to at the student athlete i think they absolutely go there because of the coach the coach is what recruits them the coach is what brings them into the to school and you see a lot of times when a coach leave a player will, will try to transfer because the coach is no longer there well i'm saying that you look at a team like kentucky who has calipari who is one of the great recruiters in all of college basketball, as much as people may hate him for being kind of a sleaze, he's a great recruiter and he's a great player's coach. But the reality is like, who was the coach before him? You had Patino, you had Tubby Smith. It didn't really matter who was there. People were going to Kentucky. When you ask the top basketball players in the country, say, Hey, what are your top four schools? They don't know who the coach, they, ah, Duke, Kentucky, North Carolina, and Kansas. And it doesn't matter who's coaching there. Which one does Bill Self coach? You know, it, it's Kansas. I know that, but most people don't know who Bill Self is. Most people don't know, you know, who the coach of North Carolina is. It's just those are the big schools kids go for the name they want to go to the same school michael jordan went to even though dean smith's not there anymore yeah i I disagree 100 percent. i get the cliche of of the name of the school but those schools also have some of the best coaches in the country so that's you know why they're there 
Yeah, I in K- Kentucky. I mean, man, they've had a bunch of sleaze ball coaches, huh? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh man! All right. So, with all of that being said, we've gone through pretty much all of our topics. We've gone through it quicker than I uh, actually had anticipated. Uh, so, what do you say we throw a bonus round in here? You guys ready for that? Yeah, bring it absolutely. On. All right. So, there's been no preparation for this. It's been something that we've been talking about here for for a little while on the network. Uh, it's been a hot topic on Facebook uh, ever since the Sosa McGuire 30 for 30 came about, uh, and that is the the steroid issue. Uh, so, the question that I'm going to pose here is that steroid era players belong in the Hall of Fame. Uh, Mike Reeves. Uh, yeah, they do, and they should allow steroids back in baseball. We we touched on this earlier. Um, it's just tough to get viewership, and and you could tell last season when there was skepticism that there was uh, tightened balls and all the home runs that were going on. People tuned in a lot more because there was a lot more points getting put put up. Um, you know, when they were juicing back in Sosa and McGuire, people were watching every single game because of that battle. Um, that was just a part of baseball. You know, there was. We, we talked about Manfred. I mean, there was no penalties back then like there is now. It's, it's kind of like weed in the NFL. They're just, they're just letting it happen, and that's what they let it do with steroids. And now when it comes out later on, you know, it's, it's so negative and bad and tarnished, and it was bad for the game. It's like, no, it was absolutely the best possible thing that could have happened for baseball at that time, and they should just keep it up. Wait, Wait a minute. Yeah. I guess I'm going to say kind of way <laughs> oh. <laughs> because, uh, you know, I, I agree with what Mike's saying here. I, I think that, you know, obviously that steroid era players should be allowed in the Hall of Fame. They're great players. Barry Bonds is the second greatest player of all time, in my opinion. Um, Roger Clemens is one of the top five pitchers, top 10 pitchers of all time, in my opinion. You've got to let these guys in. There's their statistics alone. But even, you know, just how large they were, how big they were, they were bigger than the game. In an era or in a sport where we talked about how players need to be bigger than the game to draw fans in, these guys were bigger than the game. People tuned in to watch them. And not only that, where I say kind of ways because I don't think steroids necessarily helps the game long term. It's a steroid. It's a quick boost. I mean, you have to remember Sosa McGuire. Yes, that drew fans in. Everybody knows it. McGuire hit 70 home runs. Sosa hit 66. It was exciting. We tuned in every night. Well, how about the year that Barry Bonds hit 73? Who was number two in the league? You can't tell me. You know why? Because everyone got bored of the steroid era. Everyone got bored of 700-foot home runs. It just it was cool at first because we hadn't seen it, but we grew tired of it fast. Baseball needs to constantly evolve and constantly change, and steroids is a short-term solution and a long-term not solution. So while I do think that players should be in the Hall of Fame, to answer your original question, yes, all of the steroid players should be in the Hall of Fame. A-Rod should be a first ballot. Barry Bonds should have been a first ballot. All those guys should be in there. I don't think that steroids, steroids is a long-term solution for baseball, uh, like Mike said. Nobody got bored last year when the Yankees and the Twins were at it in the last game of the season, you know, going for that home run record. Nobody gets bored of runs being scored or points being put up in any sport. Yeah, I I mean, he, he's, he's not wrong, Wayne. No, that's true. I mean, again, I think that, but like seven, six games, you know, eight, eight to seven games, I think those do get boring. And I know it's fun to watch the, but it's like soccer too. Like I love watching a team win four to one in soccer, but I don't want to see every single game five, four, then it just kind of takes away from, you know, how good the players are. And I, I don't know, it's like it diminishes the value of what they're doing. So it's cool to see a guy hit 70 home runs after nobody's hit 60 in 50 years, but to see somebody hit 70 and then two years later hit somebody else hit 70, I can tell you right now, I'm a quarter of the interest that I had the first time. Do you ever watch the Home Run Derby? Yeah, I love the Home Run Derby. Well, here's the thing. Yeah, so, oh, all right. That's well, so no, I got bored with. I was saying, I got bored of the Home Run Derby. So I love the Home Run Derby back in the day with Ken Griffey Jr. hitting it off the uh, the Camden Yards building. That was awesome. And back then, when you had just ten outs, right, and guys would hit eleven or twelve home runs, and they'd win the thing for the round. Now the guys hit forty one home runs in a round because you just keep hitting until you're done, until you're tired, and you can't lift your arms anymore, and it's boring. But I watched the second batter, and he's you know it's it's forty two to forty one for home runs in the very first round. I'm kind of like I'm bored with this. I'm gonna put on something else. Wayne's one of those baseball baseball purists he was talking about earlier. He wants a do no, he wants a do nothing shutout, you know, all defense and no way. No, I look these guys definitely belong in the Hall of Fame. I certainly agree. You guys both said it. Um, you know, then you get these teams like the Astros who are using you know uh, 
technology to go ahead and cheat and steal signs and people are starting to say oh well if you're if the uh if the astros if the steroid era is getting in and, and you can count the steroid era as being good you have to count the astros as being good i think it's a totally different ball game don't you yeah, yeah that's like cheating. when you're when you're wired up and, and cheating like that even if you're juiced baseball is still one of the hardest sports to play i mean hall of famers are hitting three out of ten so it doesn't matter that that you're jacked like, you know, the ripper when you're getting stuff, you know, touching you that, hey, it's going to be a slider. This is a change up. I mean, that's that's cheating. You know what pitch is coming. So, yeah, that's just that's bad taste. The whole franchise should be kicked out. Well, I feel like Brandon set this question up to take points away from me because we just had an argument about this. And uh, basically, the players didn't know what pitch was coming. They knew whether it was a fastball or an off speed pitch because basically the bang the drums twice if it's a fastball or bang the ball, whatever it was. And they had the buzzer telling them. So the problem is that would be helpful in high school when every pitcher in high school, even Chris Carpenter, when he's the best pitcher in high school, only throws a fastball and curveball and nothing else. But like when you're playing in the major leagues and the guy has a fastball, a curveball, a circle change, uh, a slider and a splitter, you may know an off-speed pitch is coming, but you could be swinging in the completely wrong spot. Plus, they didn't know the location. So even if you know a fastball is coming, if you don't know if it's up or if it's down or if it's out, you, you don't know. It's still a guessing game. It's a minimal, minimal advantage. An advantage, yes, but a minimal advantage. It did not help them? It didn't help them, huh? It helped only, them minimally. Only in high school, Wayne, right? It didn't minimally help the Astros? Helps. No. It helped minimally. Wayne, if you know that a fastball is coming and you're sitting fastball, then – you have a much easier time. If you know an off-speed pitch is coming, you know what pitches that guy throws. So if you know an off-speed, you know it's either a slider or a curve. So you're reacting. And if you're sitting, if you're an off-speed type hitter, that's, a, I mean, it's a huge, huge advantage. Way more of an advantage than steroids are. And that is knowing what pitch is coming, fastball or off-speed. I mean, not the exact, but that's basically knowing what pitch is coming. Well, I mean, Mario Rivera threw a splitter, and he's, you know, I mean, David Ortiz said he could walk up to you and say, hey, I'm throwing a splitter on the next pitch, and he still couldn't hit it. So I mean, well, it's, yeah, but those pitchers are few and far between. Come on now. Well, that's what I'm saying. But the, every pitcher has like that. I mean, how about uh, Araldis Chapman's slider? It's 91 miles per hour and it moves six feet. I mean, even if you know the slider's coming, you're gonna have a hard time with it. So that's what I'm saying. Is yeah, yes, it's an advantage. You have an easier time laying off of it. Well, it, it's it's an advantage to know it's not going to be 104. You know, I mean, that's an advantage. But right. at the same at the same time, you still are going to have a hard time hitting it. So it's a minimal advantage. But if I if I know if I know an off speed pitch coming, I know you throw a slider or you throw a curve. If I'm watching where the pitch starts out to where it's normally going to break, I already know where that pitch is going to land. I know whether or not where I have to react to it, the spin. I know where I've got to swing, where I've got to start my swing. It's a whole different ball game than if you don't know if you're trying to guess whether or not it's a a fastball or a slider or a fastball or a curveball. Now you know. Yeah, it these helps. are professional athletes. That you know, you said high school. That's not going to be a competitive edge. They don't know how to read pitches like they do in the majors. I mean, these are professionals, so obviously it helped them out a great deal, or they wouldn't be getting balls chucked at their head every single game that they're played in. Still, because players are pissed off because they know that they cheated badly. I mean, in my experience, professional athletes' IQs aren't really north of 90 a lot of times. And so I don't think they really understand what the advantage was that the Astros actually had. So I think that it is, like I said, it's a slight advantage to know whether it's going to be fast or slow. But again, if you've got a guy who throws a nasty, you know, somebody like Evaldi who throws like that nasty cutter, it doesn't matter if you know the cutter's coming. Which, by the way, a cutter's only two miles per hour slower than a fastball. So now you're playing Evaldi, he throws 102 or he throws 98. And the movement's completely different. You're getting the two drums, like, okay, it's going to be an off-speed pitch, and he blows it by you because 98 is still pretty fucking fast. Wayne G., did you just say all athletes are stupid? Uh, professional athletes. Yeah, professional <laughs> athletes. <laughs> you know, the extent, right. that, the extent that the Astros went uh, to try and pull this off just shows that they thought that it had a competitive edge as well. That's, I'll, I'll end with that. All right, guys. Well, that's uh, going to wrap it up for us. And the inaugural winner – of the great debate goes to Mike Reeves. So Mike, you're, we're going to go ahead and give you two minutes to just go ahead and uh, promote your show. Uh, so why don't you go ahead and take it away? Well, I want to thank Wayne from Infinity Sports. First off, great show. Second off, great battle, man. You got me sweating underneath this twist hat. First, uh, first great debate ever, and uh, glad I got a win. Hopefully, the twist fellas, my ho- my co-hosts uh, Matt Benz and Greg Greenbay Bauman, were were cheering me on from the confines of their own home. 
But you can check out our show, Twist Weekend Sports Talk, uh, like I mentioned at the beginning of the show, every Monday and Thursday on the RTF Sports Network. Check us out on our website, twistsportstalk.com. And uh, my spinoff show, Mike on the Mic, which is Tuesdays at 1 p.m. Central Time. All right, guys. Well, that was a good show. Uh, hope everybody out there and on Facebook and on YouTube enjoyed it. And uh, we will certainly be back. Congrats, Reeves. With a different, Appreciate it. <laughs> maybe with a different cast, maybe with the same cast. Who knows? And uh, see if we can get some more participation here. Uh, it was a good job, a good show. Uh, Soup Boss and, and Mike LeBlanc, i like to hear uh, what you guys have to say about the uh, MLB real quick. we got a few more minutes. I'm still salty that you took points away because I wanted to see you shorter. <laughs> <laughs> Look, any time that I'm hosting a show and you say baseball is boring, you're losing points. I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, baseball is boring. It's, uh, it, it's What do you want to know pertaining to the MLB? I want to know what, what you, you guys think about it? the steroid era. Okay, well, I think you and I have a nice show that we can we can bring uh, this to the full conversation because steroid plus cheating plus controversy is the history of professional sports, and I'll bring that up either in our next show or the Thursday edition. Yeah, I, I say leave steroids out of it. Play on your natural God given God given ability or your the talent that you've developed since you were playing in little league. You know, you got kids that that deserve to play in the league, but other people get ahead because they use steroids. What so, if they were using steroids in Little League? If if you're using steroids <laughs> in Little League, then there's something wrong with your dad. I mean, I've seen some 12-year-olds that look like they are using something. I don't know I was, if I, I was, or or what. <laughs> I was a game away from the Little League World Series, and there were kids that admitted that they were already lifting weights. And even though that's not drugs – Little kids shouldn't be lifting weights, and that's what they were doing to gain a competitive advantage. And you know what? They got to go, and we didn't. I, I don't know, my son. I, my my son is six, and and he lifts weights, and he punches the puncher bag. I don't know. I don't know if I agree with you there, Super Bowl. <laughs> He's gonna be a midget. He's gonna be twenty five and a midget, and no girls wow. gonna want to date him. Let's make a thing for midgets, man. Calm it down. Calm when it I, down. No, when kidding. I played little league, you know what I did to those kids who lifted weights? I went yard on them. Oh, what in 1940? Come on, Wayne. <laughs> Why are you making fun of my Jewish people? <laughs> back then, Wayne. I'm the old guy on the show. Back in my day, back in my day, when pitchers pitch underhand with a backhand spin, I used to be able to read that shit. <laughs> I say hello to Ty Cobb. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the one that says shoeless Joe Jackson up. <laughs> Oh man, you guys are and crazy! All, right. listeners all you guys out there, what the fuck they did? In all, all seriousness, you- Brandon, thanks for having us. It was a, yeah. it was a good time, man. A yeah. lot of fun. Yeah. Tons of fun. Again soon, guys.